Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. Before we begin the discussion, don't forget to join our Telegram channel for regular updates on current affairs. The link for the same has been provided in the description box below and you can even scan the QR code that has been provided over here. So let's take up the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at an editorial from page number 6 of the Delhi edition. This article deals with the sensitive ecology of the Himalayas and how the region has increasingly become prone to disasters. This editorial has been brought out in the context of recent disasters that have hit Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand and I'm sure you would be aware that the recent flash floods and landslides caused in Himachal Pradesh by a cloud burst has led to large scale damage to life property and as well as to infrastructure several people have been killed and injured and even cattle have been washed away during the floods and the flooding of agricultural fields has even disrupted farming along with this private property is also destroyed during any disaster and more importantly public infrastructure such as roads electricity lines schools also suffer serious damage thereby setting back the region with regard to its socio economic development so considering this large scale impact of disasters and how vulnerable the himalayan region is it's very important to understand how the delicate ecological balance in the himalayas has been disrupted by rampant development activities which has made himalayas even more vulnerable to high intensity disasters and extreme weather events which leaves behind a trail of destruction so in this context it's very important to understand the vulnerability of himalayas towards disasters in complete detail along with understanding the sensitive ecological balance in the region which is being disrupted by large scale developmental activities see the himalayas that stretch all the way from afghanistan and pakistan over here near the hindu kush range they traverse across india tibet nepal bhutan and myanmar this entire region is home to a diverse ecology and biodiversity and happens to be one of the most sensitive regions in the world since the himalayas lies in a active tectonic zone the region is already prone to earthquakes and landslides as the indian plate continues to dive under the eurasian plate it creates an active seismic zone that translates into high intensity earthquakes and landslides every now and then along with this the region is home to fast flowing rivers which are fed throughout the year by the himalayan glaciers and they also receive plenty of rainfall during the monsoons so as these fast flowing rivers flow through deep gorges and valleys they are bound to flood thus leading to disasters in the downstream along with causing secondary disasters like landslides this sensitive ecological region is also considered as the third pole after the arctic and the antarctic due to the large volumes of fresh water that is frozen in the glaciers which are currently melting at a rapid pace due to climate change and global warming so this long term disruption being caused by global warming to weather patterns and climatic patterns is further increasing the frequency and amplitude of disasters in the region because such a massive disruption to the water cycle is increasing the occurrence and intensity of extreme weather events such as flash floods cloud burst events and it poses a very serious risk to not just life and property in the region but also to the sensitive ecology and biodiversity of the region along with this natural vulnerability of the himalayan region man made factors including climate change and global warming and rampant development and construction activities have made the region even more vulnerable and especially the construction of large projects such as dams creation of roads exploitative tourism and real estate construction have all led to the upsetting of the sensitive ecological balance of the himalayas and are single handedly held responsible for the increasing frequency and intensity of disasters in the region this map over here depicts how dam projects have been taken up in the region and studies have shown that that the himalayan belt would have the highest dam intensity in the world thus further increasing the ecological and social risks in the region for instance in himachal pradesh alone where recent disasters were witnessed 
there are around 41 hydroelectric projects along with 76 new ones that have been planned and such large scale developmental and construction activities leads to permanent destabilization of the Himalayan ecology. Various studies have clearly established that the Himalayas is perhaps the world's most vulnerable region to the impact of climate change and global warming after the polar areas. And these studies have clearly established that rising temperatures have already started accelerating the melting of glaciers across the Himalayan belt, which is leading to unprecedented floods in the river basins, stretching all the way from the Indus to the Ganga to the Brahmaputra. So India, which lies right in the middle of the Himalayas, is definitely very vulnerable to the impact of these disasters. And this infographic over here depicts the vulnerability index of India's Himalayan states. All the Himalayan states, including the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir, which currently has been reconstituted into the Union territories of JNK and Ladakh, they are all highly vulnerable to the impact of extreme weather events and global warming. Because these states are not just border states, but we also have active conflicts going on, accompanied with poor connectivity and infrastructure and lack of development in the region. As a result, people here don't have a secure livelihood and this makes them all the more vulnerable to the impact of disasters. So of course, to make the region resilient and to make the communities here resilient enough to withstand the impact of disasters, you need to bring about development which includes infrastructure development as well. However, this infrastructure development has to be sustainable by keeping in mind the sensitive ecology of the region because rampant and haphazard construction activities further destabilizes the region. And it is this argument which is being brought out in this editorial. See, in India, during the monsoon season, the country receives almost 75% of its annual rainfall. Basically, a majority of its rainfall is compressed into just around 4 months. So obviously, it brings a sudden and huge volume of water into its river basins. And disasters like floods are bound to happen across various drainage basins. But these natural disasters have been further amplified as a result of climate change, which has triggered extreme weather events. And the pre-existing vulnerability of the region further amplifies the impact of these disasters. That's the reason why the editorial is urging the authorities to implement a structured disaster management cycle as envisioned under India's Disaster Management Act so that there is focus in all the phases of disaster management. This includes priority being given to pre-disaster phase along with adequate preparation for the during disaster and post disaster phases. In the pre-disaster phase, there should be focus on improving our early warning and forecasting systems. Because currently, even though the IMD or the Indian Meteorological Department is providing early warning forecasting services with regard to heavy rains, cloud burst events, etc., many of these assessments are not accurate enough to provide for timely evacuation of the affected areas. So as a short-term measure, India will have to improve the efficiency of its early warning and forecasting systems through better investments in science and research as accurate and effective early warning can generate real-time alerts which can be very precious as this small window of opportunity could be used by the local authorities to carry out timely evacuations. Along with this, as a short to medium term measure, the authorities at all the levels, that is at the national level, the state level and the local level, will have to step up their preparedness to implement preventive and mitigative steps through both structural and non-structural measures. Under structural measures, physical measures will have to be taken up to shield the population against the impact of floods and landslides. And under non-structural measures, better policies will have to be implemented to identify the vulnerable zones where construction and habitation can be restricted and regulated. Then as part of post-disaster phase, there should be focus on long-term planning in order to truly make the region resilient to withstand the impact of disasters and to help the region adapt to the impact of climate change and global warming. This will require focus on reconstruction and rehabilitation so that the affected communities can be protected, especially with regard to their livelihood and shelter. And only such measures can truly make the region resilient to the impact of these disasters. 
But the bottom line is that there should be a delicate balance established between development and protecting the ecology of the region. And this mandates the prioritization of sustainable development in all the developmental activities of the region. Now let's take up a column from page number 7 that deals with the topic of center-state financial relations. Before we get into the article, first let's understand a few details about center-state financial relations. See, under the Indian constitution, from articles 268 to 293, we have a set of provisions that define the financial relations between the center and the states. It deals with taxes levied by the union government but collected and kept by the states as defined under Article 268. Then we have Article 269 that provides for taxes levied and collected by the union but assigned to the states. Then Article 270 provides for taxes levied and distributed between the union and states. Further. Article 273, 275 and 282 deal with grant in aid from the centre to the states and there are few other provisions related to sharing of proceeds between the centre and states from the revenue that is collected through various sources. Following the taxes levied and collected by the union and the states, the responsibility of distributing the collected revenue between the centre and the states falls upon the Finance Commission which is a constitutional body constituted under Article 280 of the Constitution. It decides upon the distribution of divisible taxes from the central pool. And upon this, we also have the GST regime that was introduced through the 101st Constitutional Amendment Act, which transformed indirect taxation in the country and abolished various central and state indirect taxes and led to the introduction of one nation, one tax system. Before GST was introduced, different taxes were imposed by centre and states and had led to a confusing tax setup, which was also seen to be impeding economic growth in the country. So through the landmark 101st Constitutional Amendment, GST was introduced to provide for a one nation, one tax model in indirect taxation and the sharing of this revenue between centre and states is decided by the GST Council as per the provisions of Article 279A and to compensate for the losses that states incur for implementing GST, the centre has committed to provide GST compensation for a few years. And this constitutes a brief explanation of the financial relations between the centre and the states. Now this topic is in news because recently the chief ministers of various states, they appealed to the Prime Minister and the Niti Aayog regarding falling state revenue. As several states have felt that their share in the divisible pool of taxes is shrinking even though they are carrying a bigger burden of incurring expenditure for welfare programs. See, under the constitutional scheme of things, revenue generation and collection has been largely vested with the centre whereas expenditure for welfare schemes and programs has been largely placed on the states. According to the findings of the 15th Finance Commission, out of the total revenue that is collected by centre and states, 62.7% of it is levied and collected by the centre. Whereas, out of the total expenditure, 62.4% of the expenditure is incurred by states on various welfare programmes. So clearly, as you can see, in the constitutional scheme of things, states incur higher expenditure, whereas the centre corners most of the revenue. This is the reason why the centre distributes the revenue to the states from the central pool of divisible taxes and complement states' resources in order to help the states to deal with their increased expenditure burden. But however, this distribution of revenue is not always fair for all the states and many states often complain that they contribute more revenue whereas they receive very little in return from the centre which places a bigger burden on developed and fast-growing states as they compensate for the slow-growing and backward states. Hence, during the recent meeting of the Niti Aayog, several chief ministers of large states, they demanded a higher share from the divisible pool of taxes and they've also demanded the centre to extend GST compensation for few more years. So this mismatch in centre-state financial relations is further depicted through four charts over here. And as you can see in chart number one, the union government raises more revenue and collects a large share of proceeds from the states as well. But the expenditure burden is clearly more on the states 
when it comes to funding welfare schemes and programs. Subsequent finance commissions, especially the 14th and 15th finance commission, have tried to address this imbalance by providing for higher devolution of resources to the states, but quite often the centre fails to implement the devolution that is recommended. For example, the 15th Finance Commission has recommended a devolution of 41% to the states. But the actual share of devolved funds to states stands at around 30% on average, thus indicating the imbalance in centre-state financial relations. The third chart over here shows how the state share in central taxes has gone down, whereas the centre's share in the divisible pool of taxes has gone up over the years. The fourth chart over here shows various cess, surcharge and other revenues and taxes collected by the centre which are not devolved to the states, thereby giving the union a higher share of revenue, whereas placing a higher degree of burden with regard to expenditure on the states. So essentially this column here is trying to highlight the complaints of few states with regard to their falling share in revenue from the central pool of divisible taxes. And hence, some of the larger states which contribute more revenue, they are demanding a higher share and they are even seeking an extension to GST compensation. Now let's look at this column from page number 6, written by M.K. Narayanan, the former National Security Advisor of India and the former Director of Intelligence Bureau. In this detailed column, he analyzes the upcoming 20th Party Congress of China which is essentially a summit of the top leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Now some of you might wonder, how is this development, which refers to China's internal politics, how is it relevant for our exams? See, since China poses the greatest threat and competition for India in the coming decades, as aspiring bureaucrats and diplomats, you would be expected to have a sound understanding of China and its motivations. So in order to gain that understanding, you need to take a deeper look at China's internal politics as well, along with its history, even though it is not directly relevant for the exams. Because it sets the background which is much needed to gain a deeper insight into China's thinking, which helps better understand its economic and strategic policies. As most of you know, China happens to be an authoritarian state ruled by a single party, which is the Communist Party of China or the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP forms the Chinese state, that is the PRC or the People's Republic of China. And recently the party even marked its 100th anniversary in 2021. So to understand the significance of the upcoming 20th National Congress of the CCP, you need a brief background about the history of CCP and its structure. See, the Chinese Communist Party was formed in the year 1921 and through the 1930s, it managed to organize a people-led rebellion under the leadership of Mao Zedong, who laid down the foundation of Maoism. Maoism, which is a type of left-wing extremism, provided for a radical interpretation of communism and socialism and called for a people's war against the state. And this eventually led to the Chinese Civil War of the 1940s. At the end of the Civil War, the Maoists won the conflict and they threw out the government, that is the Republic of China, which retreated to Taiwan. And under the leadership of Mao Zedong, CCP captured power in mainland China and thus established the modern Chinese state, which we know as PRC or the People's Republic of China. Immediately after the constitution of PRC, the country started displaying territorial ambitions and expansionist tendencies and it went on to annex Tibet, thus clearly displaying its intention to resort to aggression if needed in order to enhance the national power of PRC. Then throughout 1950s, 1960s and 1970s, during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, the PRC came out with many atrocious policies that not only caused immense suffering to its people, but also led China to lay the economic foundation that was needed to transform the country into an economic superpower in the coming decades. Gradually, as China opened up to US and the Western countries, China opened up its economy and by 1980s, it started focusing on industrial-led growth with focus on SEZs or Special Economic Zones and industrial clusters. Under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, China registered tremendous growth through the 1980s 
which continued throughout 1990s and early 2000s as well. Within two, three decades, China emerged as a major global power and started consolidating its position across Asia. And as it ran into a direct competition with the Western countries and the US, China started displaying a lot of aggression across the region, along with making attempts to strengthen its hold over Tibet, Xinjiang and Hong Kong, which have always been problematic areas for China internally. Now, over the last one decade, especially since 2013, China has seen the emergence of another authoritarian leader in the form of Xi Jinping, who has not only strengthened his hold over the Communist Party, but has also laid down ambitious plans for China, including the Belt and Road Initiative, to ensure China's global domination as it directly challenges the superpower status of the United States. If you look at the Chinese Communist Party, it is organized into a hierarchical leadership, where at the bottom of the pyramid, you have around 90 million followers who serve as the ground workers and members of the party, followed by a small group of National Party Congress at the local level, that is at the provincial level, which further narrows down into a central committee of 300 odd members at the central government. And the higher reaches of the leadership is constituted with a Politburo consisting of around 25 members. And the Politburo Standing Committee, which is the equivalent of India's Union Cabinet, is led by the top seven members of the Communist Party and with the General Secretary of the Party being the President of the country as well. These top Politburo members, they go on to head important commissions, ministries and agencies. And at the level of the Central Committee, the Central Military Commission, which oversees the armed forces of China, including the PLA, including its Navy and Air Force, along with the armed police, comes under the direct control of the Supreme Commander, who is none other than the General Secretary and the President. It's in this context that the National Congress of CCP acquires importance for other countries like India, because any country which is deeply concerned about China will definitely monitor the developments of this National Congress. The National Congress is an event or a summit that is held once in five years that brings together all the top leaders of the CCP that we just discussed. And they not only lay down the future path for China and the Communist Party, but also decide on the leadership positions. And hence, the National Congress is a key event which is closely watched by many countries that are interested in China. So by the end of this year, the 20th National Congress will be held, most likely somewhere between October to November. And the biggest development that is expected is that the current General Secretary, Xi Jinping, is likely to be retained for another term thus making him the president of PRC for another record term. This will make Xi Jinping the first president after Mao Zedong to serve the country for more than two consecutive terms. Because for Xi Jinping, the Communist Party has broken its own convention of retiring its leaders after the age of 68. Usually post 68 years, the top leaders of the Politburo Standing Committee, they retire and step down. And during the National Congress, the new leaders are appointed who go on to head key arms and divisions of the government. Usually during the National Congress, the future successors are also chosen, who are likely to become the General Secretary and thus the President of the country. But this time, it is unlikely to happen because Xi Jinping has cemented his position and his control over the CCP and is likely to remain the President for one more term. But definitely it will give an indication about China's future leaders who might potentially become successors to Xi Jinping in the coming decade. Now let's take up another important column from page number 7. This article evaluates the functioning of Anganwadi services in the country. See, Anganwadi services were launched in 1975 under the ICDS or the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme as a centrally sponsored scheme with specific focus on the overall development of young children, especially those under the age of six years, along with focus on maternal health, in order to drive up the health and education indicators of children and pregnant women. The primary focus of this centrally sponsored scheme is to improve the nutritional and health status of children in the age group of zero to six years, that is the focus is mainly on infants, and to lay the foundation for overall psychological, physical and social development of the child. 
So it focuses not just on nutritional aspects and sanitation, but also focuses on healthcare aspects including immunization and also on early education of the child. The priority is to reduce the incidence of mortality, morbidity and malnutrition, which later places a huge burden on the country. The priority is to drive down infant mortality rates and also to reduce the incidence of malnutrition, which further leads to deficiencies and sickness amongst children. Anganwadi services through Anganwadi workers under the ICDS scheme, they also try to achieve effective coordination of implementing various health and education policies of the government which are focused on child development and also tries to enhance the capabilities of the mother to look after not just her health and nutrition but also to look after the health and nutritional needs of her children. So it is truly a convergent program that has created dedicated institutions at the grassroots to look after supplementary nutrition, to provide referral health services and to ensure regular health checkup of the young children and the mother and to focus on immunization and ensure that all of them are vaccinated on time along with prioritizing early formal education and the nutritional and health needs of the children. So this ambitious program is critical for India to achieve its priority socio-economic objectives in order to ensure the well-being of children and mothers. So the writers of the column carry out an assessment of the Anganwadi scheme and they are of the opinion that even though the scheme has achieved a lot, it has not been implemented to its full potential. Hence, they are calling upon the government to make certain changes to the ICDS program and to the Anganwadi services scheme so that three areas of lacuna can be addressed. The writers are asking the government to focus on the parents as stakeholders and not just to focus on the children. Under the current scheme, the primary focus is on young children under the age of 6 years and on the mothers, but there is no recognition for the father and the parents as a couple who are eventually going to be responsible for the overall well-being of their child. Another key aspect which has been ignored under the program is the importance of language. Especially when it comes to early formal education, there is a need to prioritize local vernacular languages along with English to truly enable the children to gain all the skills they need as they progress through the formal education system. And finally, there needs to be focus on people's participation because large community participation at the local level can enable the work of Anganwadi workers to achieve greater efficiency and also to increase the reach of the program because community involvement will bring a greater sense of responsibility and ownership at the local level which could be critical to drive the program towards efficiency. Next, we have an important column on page number 7 that examines the current political situation in Myanmar. At the beginning of last year, that is in February 2021, Myanmar's military again captured power in the country by declaring an emergency and it nullified democratic elections and brought back military rule in the country. Myanmar is not new to the rule of the military junta as the country has been under military rule almost throughout 1960s until 2010. As democracy was taking root between 2010 and 2020, this triggered fears amongst the military about losing control and hence they have recaptured power in the country by nullifying the elections and by arresting the entire civilian leadership including elected leaders. Following the declaration of last year's emergency, mass protests broke out in Myanmar led by civilians and political activists and Myanmar has not hesitated to use maximum force against the protesters and this has led to large-scale human rights violations over the last one and a half years. So as the political and democratic situation deteriorated again in Myanmar, the Western countries targeted the country with their economic sanctions again, but it hasn't had the desired impact. This is where the writers argue that the key powers of the region, that is ASEAN, China and India, have the best potential to bring back stability in Myanmar by working out a reconciliation between the military and the political leaders in order to fulfill the democratic aspirations of the civilians. But in this regard, China has not shown much interest, but instead it has increased its economic engagement with Myanmar as China continues to have a strategic relationship with Myanmar's military. ASEAN has tried putting pressure on Myanmar, but it hasn't worked 
So some of the ASEAN countries are considering punitive action to punish Myanmar's military. India, on the other hand, has often taken a neutral stand on issues concerning the internal matters of Myanmar, as Myanmar happens to be critical for India in order to counter China and its influence in the region. Historically, despite the internal turbulences, India has always maintained close ties with Myanmar's army. But the writers argue that India can do much more than this while protecting its interests with Myanmar's military. India could play a positive role to act as a reconciliator by working with few close friends in the ASEAN group, as India has built close ties with Southeast Asian countries under its Look East, Act East policy. India could work with key ASEAN powers like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and even Vietnam and can put pressure on Myanmar's military to push towards reconciliation while parallelly using the resources and the contacts in the northeast of India to provide immediate relief to Myanmar's civilians. And thus, India could play a positive role in stabilizing the situation according to the writers. Now let's take a look at the last article from page number 12. India and Iran have signed a key agreement known as the Certificates of Competency in Unlimited Voyages in order to facilitate the movement of seafarers between the two countries by using the strategic Chabahar port. This agreement that has been signed is in line with the provisions of the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification and Watchkeeping for Seafarers of 1978. This agreement which is in line with the International Convention will facilitate the easy movement of seafarers who take part in maritime shipping and thus promotes trade and connectivity between the two countries. It will specifically enable the movement of seafarers between the Chabahar port and India, which has been built by India at a strategic location in the Arabian Sea. India has funded the construction of the strategic Chabahar port located over here, which faces the Strait of Hormuz, which is a choke point in the Persian Gulf. At the Chabahar port, the Shahid Behesti terminal is operated and controlled by an Indian port company. And through this ambitious connectivity project, India's vision was to connect easily with Afghanistan and further with the resource-rich Central Asia region. Before the Taliban took over Afghanistan, India had very friendly relations with the Afghan civilian government and had invested heavily in the country. And as a part of this reconstruction efforts, India had built a strategic road connecting Zaranj with Dalaram and Kabul in Afghanistan. This Indian-built road in Afghanistan almost reached the Iranian border, where India and Iran were jointly planning to build a railway line called the Chabahar Railway Line to connect with the Iranian border town of Zahedan so that these two projects could be linked to enable a direct connection between India and Afghanistan via Iran. For this purpose, the three countries had even signed a trilateral agreement in 2017 to facilitate the movement of goods. And over the last few years, a lot of cargo had been moved between India and Afghanistan by using the Chabahar port of Iran. Even when the latest crisis happened, India delivered food aid through the Chabahar port to help out the people of Afghanistan. So the signing of this agreement between India and Iran is likely to enable the free movement of seafarers by using the Chabahar port. And this could act as a trade multiplier for the region because Chabahar port is strategically located and it could boost the economy of the entire region, including the economy of South Asia, Central Asia and the Persian Gulf. Now let's take a look at the mains practice questions. The first question, rampant development of mountain areas over the years has upset the sensitive ecological balance of the Himalayas. Illustrate the consequences with examples. The second question, the share of the states in divisible pool of taxes is shrinking despite their carrying a higher burden of expenditure. Examine. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link has been provided in the description box below. So with this, let's conclude our discussion for today. And if you like the initiative, do let us know by sharing your comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and do hit the like button on the video. Thanks for watching.